Okay, good uh, evening, everyone. It's uh, great to, to be here. Now, I want to uh, tell you a bit of work that I did towards uh, the end of my PhD, which I, I recently finished at the computer laboratory at the, the University of Cambridge. And uh, that's this thing, Captain Buzz, which is what we describe as being the, the real meaning of airplane mode for your phone. So I want to start by asking just with a gentle wave, how many people have ever owned a smartphone that isn't the one that they currently have on them today? Okay, so it looks like, you know, a good two-thirds of people in here. Now, in the UK, it's quite sad. It's only around 10% of smartphones that when people are finished with actually recycle. So uh, using this room as a represent representative sample of the UK as a whole, it means that there's definitely a, a huge ton of smartphones that are basically sat at the back of people's drawers and, and doing nothing. So uh, about 18 months ago, uh, me and a few of my colleagues at the university wanted to find something cool to, to do with these. Um, and we decided it'd be really cool if you could take all these old smartphones out of your drawer, which may have you know, broken Wi-Fi, screen not working, slightly iffy battery life, and put them to use for something cool. And we decided building, uh, a smart, building a drone that you can fly entirely with your smartphone was the, the, uh, a cool thing. So we set about this project. What we wanted to do was build uh, what we believe to be the world's first drone that's flown entirely by smartphone. So as far as possible, have no other electronics on board, so the smartphone just being the complete autopilot. You may ask, why do you want to do that? Now, one reason is because we can, and we thought it'd be fun. Uh, another reason is that we, we noticed it was the 165th anniversary of the first drone. So these were called the uh, Austrian balloons. It's what you see up here in the, the top left. Now, these were uh, basically war devices. So the Austrians were at war with uh, Venice, of, of all places, and uh, wanted to cause mass uh, devastation to that famous Venice road system. So what they did was they built these sort of big balloons where there was oil that would burn in the middle, so the, the gas would expand, it would lift off, and then if they're lucky and the winds are blowing the right direction and they've timed the oil correctly, the oil will run out, it'll come down and explode over Venice and uh, you know, blow up whatever's in Venice. And really since then, the, if you look at the state of what people have been doing with drones, it's largely been dominated by militaries. We've had the V1s, V2s, and even today, things like Hunter Hawks, uh, which remain as controversial as ever. But when we looked around, it wasn't all bad news. This thing here is quite cool if you haven't seen it. It costs about 20 pounds off eBuy, and it's the world's smallest drone. It fits on the, the palm of your hand, and uh, they claim that it's so light that even if you crash it, it doesn't have enough energy to destroy itself, but I'm uh, not entirely convinced. So we thought, well, we want to go and build a drone. And we started looking at how, what sort of thing do you do nowadays to, to build a drone? And the first thing that we did was kind of look online, and people say, oh, you know, you can build your own drone using things like an Arduino, and all you need is an Arduino, which is great if, like, you want to add one to three and stuff, but, like, most drones need some sort of sensors and to know where they are and things like that, and uh, also need to be able to, to control the drone around the sky. So you, you then go and hit eBay, and you buy all these, like, random things, like barometers, GPS, things to log, cameras you can take cool selfies. Uh, and you get all of them delivered when they've come from like China on the boat, and six months later it's the middle of the winter and you've got all your stuff together. So you, you then go and assemble, and you kind of end up with something that vaguely looks like this. You, know, you get a pile of wires together, and you, you need to then try and write the software to build it. So we actually did this. We uh, bought to, in, in parts a hexacopter, got all the bits together, spent a few weeks assembling it, programming it. Then uh, we're taking it out on the second flight, and uh, before, just before we uh, hand it over to the autopilot, we're just giving it a test run around the sky. I said to my friend, God, James, you've got that flying high up there. He turned around and said, oh, don't worry, it's, it's well within the safety limit, and the, the legal limits of flying. Uh, I was like, well, you wouldn't want it to crash from there, would you? And uh, lo and behold, about 10 seconds later, half of the engines turned off, so the thing did a nice cartwheel in the air. We spent a good <coughs> half hour picking up parts from, from playing fields. And uh, it, was, it was a bit sad, never flew again. We were really thinking, well, all these parts that you, know, you try and get together, what you're trying to get out of it is like, where is the, where, where is the drone? How is it moving? Um, like, can we take pictures? And you think, well, you have all of this in your pocket. Like, it's in your phone already. Could we build a drone using just one of these things? So, uh, well, we got to work. So the, the first thing we did was build a, an airframe because not invented here syndrome is a real anywhere that you go and there's, there's techie people. So uh, we got a laser cutter and some foam boards. So if you've seen this stuff, it's like two or three millimeters of foam covered in card. It's super cheap. We bought like 10 of these sheets, about 30 pounds. I think a complete airframe costs about like five pounds to build. Um, then when we get all of that, we assemble it and it, it looks something like this. So this is basically the foam board hot glued uh, all over the place and then 
copious amounts of sellotape and uh, more sellotape to cover the scratches. So this, this hair frame we, we call Hopper 3, named after Andy Hopper, the uh, co-founder of, of ARM. Um, I'll let you guess why it's Hopper 3 and where Hopper 1 and 2 may have ended up. So what we built was a smartphone app, which you can see on the left. So it's just a standard Android smartphone app. You, you launch it and you get a, an artificial horizon like that, and it creates a, a buzzing sound. And then what we actually do is use the buzzing sound coming out of the headphone jack and connect the headphone jack to two servos on the Delta Wing glider, which means that you can uh, 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 control the app around, around the, the sky. Now, Captain Buzz comes with an uh, add-on purchase, which is if you pay 59 pence extra, you get this wonderful ground crew team who uh, helped design it. So there's, uh, from left to right, people who have helped on the project. Uh, Ramsey Farragher, Daniel Wagner, James Snee, Brian Jones, and uh, Timothy Go, who have all been instrumental in this work. So the rough thing that you do is, uh, uh, initially we, we can fly the drone up to a safe height uh, using a, a standard controller. Uh, this is just to make sure we don't have any incidences when we're too near the ground or, uh, or, or landing. But in principle, we could use the, the app from, from the start. And this is the app running. As you uh, hear, when you turn up the volume, it makes a horrible buzzing sound. This is uh, super annoying to debug. And surprisingly often, you do actually have to do debugging by, by listening, which interestingly is how they debug the EDSAC as well. So uh, when you plug it in, you can then flick a switch on the controller, and then uh, when you do so, you, the, the uh, servos will move around corresponding to what you do with the app. So this is the uh, drone trying to fly straight and level, and we're just using the accelerometers, gyros, and whatnot on the phone to understand how it's currently positioned and, and the, uh, how to move around. So then when you fly the app, you, you put the... Uh, the, the phone inside the drone, throw it away, and the, the phone does all the rest. It really brings an entirely new meaning to the idea of my phone has just crashed. So basically what we're doing here is pulse width modulation. So this is an audio signal that square waves that are normally 20 milliseconds apart, and you uh, either lengthen or, or shorten them to change uh, the signal you, you output. Um, and then we uh, just output that, and that's how we, we move left and right. In terms of processing, we, we basically take all of the inputs from the phone, so GPS, gyros, um, accelerometers, fuse all of these together, and then work out how we move from where we are at the moment to where we want to be. And then there's the, the normal things like nested PID loops uh, in order to do all of that magic. So uh, this is the sort of thing that we uh, have extended Captain Buzz to do. So whilst I said initially that what we wanted to do was to have no other electronics on board, uh, and, and all the things I've shown you so far have involved no other electronics. If you want to control more than two channels, it's a bit difficult because few humans have more than two ears. So uh, until that change happens with evolution, we've had to use electronics. So if you want to control uh, things like rudders, you can then use this breakout board that we've designed where you can do multiplexing of audio channels on top of each other. But that's sort of an aside. We, we're not using that for like the core work here. So just as a recap, what we basically do is have a, a battery in the drone that, that, that powers the motor. Um, then the app um, talks to the drone, mo moves the servos, and just for debugging and flying and things, we have this uh, buddy box system so you can control the drone from the ground and uh, take over if there's any emergency or any other thing that you, you need to worry about. So uh, having built the thing, we, we decided to evaluate it. Now we went for a very scientific approach of uh, two different technologies and having a tick box between them. So on the left, we've got a uh, Google Project Tango. This is like the latest thing that Google are really trying to push. It costs 250 pounds in a very geeky way from the Google Play Store, and it's uh, the, the technology that Google are trying to push is, uh, for positioning, so it has uh, structured light and does various um, uh, visual flow uh, algorithms. On the right, this is a Hunter Hawk, so this is several billion pounds worth of US military equipment. So we're going to go for a rough comparison of like what can phones do compared to uh, several orders of magnitude larger with a drone. So one thing you want your, your, phone, your drone to do is be able to do inertial sensing. So kind of know, am I going up, down, left, right, all these sorts of things. And uh, what we decided was that your phone can have one tick here, but the Hunter Hawk gets two. So Hunter Hawks are definitely better than your phone at uh, inertial sensing. So uh, the, the chips in your phone might cost 10, uh, yeah, about 10 cents. The ones in, in the commercial uh, drones will cost several million pounds. And the difference is that if you use your phone and double integrate the acceleration to get um, uh, displacement, then you're going to end up going at max six across the Atlantic in about a minute. Whereas these things here, if you, if you do that, you can get an error of only a few miles of, in, in a few days, which is OK. So we've lost that one. However, GNSS, so that's things like GPS, Galileo, and GLONASS, uh, that we've actually given ourselves two stars for that one, and the Hunter Hawk only one. 
So why is your phone better than, uh, than the state of the art? Does anyone know? Yeah? <laughs> yes. OK, so uh, your phone uses both GPS, the American system, and GLONASS, the Russian system. All US and UK military equipment only uses the GPS system. GPS is run by the Amer American military, so if we fall out with them over like Brexit or something, that's a bit sad. Or if uh, someone goes in and hacks, or there's a, a, a bug that brings down GPS, all of the UK and US military equipment is, is denied. And this is something that the Department of Defense is very worried about at the moment, and throwing money at GPS denied situations. So you could get to the point where smartphone phones are about the only autonomous uh, drones flying around the UK, and all other defenses are out. Does the drone not have GPS Sorry? What do you mean? So military GPS has a precision mm. tunnel on it. Mm. So you get better resolution. Sure, you do, but the, the, the problem is more GPS denied situations. So if you so as the South as the North Koreans do, you wipe out GPS in South Korea um, by basically transmitting really high noise, and then you get into an arms race of who can have the best antenna arrays and things like that. But basically, it, it's a really hard problem to, to solve GPS denied. And if someone just hacks the base stations and turns off the signal, like you're screwed, right? Um, okay, in terms of alternative navigation, uh, so this is things what, that you can do if GPS is denied. We've slightly cheekily given ourselves two ticks and the Hunt Hawk one because you can use all of the visual flow algorithms which are much more state of the art than the, the military process to, to work out where you are and distances you've traveled and things like this. Um, and also with all the sensors you have on the phone, you can then use uh, ground stations in order to track. The high computational performance your phone loses out. There's, uh, the power on the phone is definitely less than on a, on a military piece of equipment, and you could just put a Raspberry Pi in one of these things, and you're always going to keep up with any growth in mobile phones, which is a bit sad. But the last one's kind of cool, which is reprogrammable on the fly. So a nice thing you can do if you have your drone being flown by an app is use the App Store to push updates to the drone whilst it's flying around. Because normally you want to land the drone and then update it and then fly it and say, oh, how does it work now? But it's like really tedious. It's complete faff to land the thing, plug it in, and then fly it again. It's much more fun if you just push a new brain to it as it flies. And uh, we haven't found any instances where the US or UK military have pushed entire new brains whilst they're <laughs> on the way to the war zone. Yeah, that's probably classified. <laughs> <laughs> the assumption is you just have one. They could have multiple, multiple algorithms and multiple firmware running, um, because they normally have Cora. Mm. So they run N out of K, and then they do the polling. That's how they do stuff. And this stuff to space. So I would be very surprised if that were not the case, because otherwise, you know, things that you said, a lot of the attacks would be very, very effective. Oh. Okay, yeah, uh, so, so we spoke to a few military people and they're like, yeah, we, we, we try not to push the entire new thing. So yeah, you could do various things like quorum assembly, but then like, how can you replace that in flight? So you can do one at a time? Yeah, but then, then you have the thing which decides which one to go for, right? And not okay, right? So you just pull and do an end okay. Okay. Fair. Okay. Or you can run consensus algorithms if you really want to. Oh, yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, so there are other benefits of um, using smartphones. So one of the really cool things is you get really rich uh, APIs. So with just a few lines of code, you can uh, go in and use various things like uh, uh, the Twitter API and then get your drone to send tweets. You can send, use Snapchat or Foursquare and send various other things. We're, we're currently working on a Google Cardboard first-person view so that as your drone flies around, you can... Uh, use the, the uh, cameras on there and then kind of sit on the ground and see what your plane's seeing. Um, we've actually already built an Android Wear extension, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I th we also think this is the first time where you can say to your watch, OK, Buzz, fly in a loop the loop, and your drone will fly in a loop the loop. So I don't know if the military have watches <coughs> flying their drones, but maybe they do. So uh, you probably want to see it fly. So uh, here you can see this is just as taking off and... Uh, so this is flying around fields in Cambridge. Now, if you, if you go around here, um, I think we're just about to, to fly in a loop the loop. So uh, this could be it. Human, so this is the human, and I think we uh, then do a, a Captain Buzz loop the loop. Yeah, so as you can see, well, here's some flying left and right uh, and various other maneuvers. Then uh, on the next video, one of the really nice things actually about Captain Buzz is that w when we fly, it's kind of, you know, flying like go left, go right. Captain Buzz is actually quite a fighter pilot, so uh, 
we, we've uh, got the, the loops tuned up so high that you command it on a head, it just like swings round into that angle. Um, one of the, the reasons for this is that uh, to, to stay within UK legislation of how far your drone can fly, you actually need to basically keep flying round. And if you want it to do anything more interesting than circles, you need to uh, pull quite sharp turns, really. <laughs> 